I'm Dr. John Swafford. I'm an interventional pain specialist who has specialized through anesthesia. I'm based in Indianapolis, Indiana. My background is both in academics as well as in private practice. Today we're going to talk about the SI joint, both its history as well as its presentation. We're going to talk about the physical exam as well as the SI joint injection. The SI joint injection is important because it's the reference standard for diagnosing SI joint pain. I see a significant number of SI joint patients in my practice. A number of them are direct referrals for an SI joint injection. In my practice, I see a significant number of back pain, groin pain, buttock pain, and leg pain uh, patients that were referred over for evaluation that in the course of their history and their physical examination, it was very suggestive that they actually had SI joint pain. In an SI joint history, there are typically seven points that you can listen for. One, do they have stabbing buttock pain? They may describe it as an ice pick or a stabbing or dagger-like feeling over their upper buttock area. Two, do they have pain with sitting? Three, do they have pain when they transition from sitting to standing or standing to sitting? Four, do they have pain going upstairs? Five, do they have groin pain? Six, do they have leg pain? And seven, do they have pain that wakes them up at night if they roll over on the affected side? In the history, there are usually three common findings that are consistent with SI joint disease. One is a history of previous back surgery, especially lumbar fusion. Two, trauma, such as a slip and fall onto the buttock or three, pregnancy with a persistent pain that has continued after the delivery. If they have back pain as a component of their uh, pain complaint, then I perform a lumbar exam. That would consist of pain with sitting, pain with axial loading of the lumbar spine. I'll have them stand up, hyperextend, and rotate to check the lumbar facets, palpate the facets themselves, and the paravertebral musculature. All my patients get a full neuro exam of the lower extremity, which consists of sensory testing, motor testing, a straight leg raise, as well as quantifying their deep tendon reflexes. Also included is a hip exam with internal and external rotation of the femur. I'll frequently incorporate the scour test to further evaluate the hip when I'm doing my SI provocative maneuvers. So the SI exam will start off with the patient first pointing to where their pain is located. That's typically called the fork finger if they point within about a centimeter to the PSIS on the affected side. Palpation of that region is quite painful. That can be done with the patient either standing and or sitting. You can differentiate between their lumbar spine or the L5 S1 region versus the inferior SI joint pull with the palpation. That can be important when you're performing the provocative testing so that you can pre-focus the patient onto this area for the testing. I try to educate the patient to pain that's coming from the lumbar spine versus the buttock or sacral sulcus or the hip prior to performing the provocative testing. As I find this is helpful for the patient to focus in on the buttock or sacral region when I'm performing these maneuvers. I perform five provocative tests. If you have three of those five being positive, that's highly suggestive of SI joint disease. Another component of the SI joint exam is functional testing. There is gait, sitting, transitioning back to standing, and stepping up. Gait basically entails having the patient stand up and start ambulating or walking. You're looking for an antalgic gait. They're going to offload the sensitive or painful side and walk primarily on the better limb. Some of the aspects of gait analysis that you'll see is they usually are slightly forward bent. Their stance phase is shortened and their foot or limb is slightly externally rotated as they walk. The sitting aspect of the exam, generally a low, hard 
seat or surface is beneficial. What you do is you have the patient sit on that surface and then you have them rate their pain. You also watch as to how balanced they are in their pelvis or their ischial tuberosities. Generally, they'll offload to the non-painful side. The next step is you have them transition from sitting to standing and you gauge their pain at mid-rise. The last thing that you evaluate is just a simple step up. And first have them step up with the good limb or leg so that you can evaluate their normal motion. Then have them step up with the more painful side and have them rate in a visual analog scale their pain. During the course of the functional exam, all components may not be positive. They may have a relatively normal gait, but yet may have significant pain when they sit or they transition from sitting to standing. Another aspect that is uh, usually quite positive or quite painful is the stepping up, but yet in some patients they may be able to step up and down uh, quite easily. So there's quite a bit of variation within the functional exam. The following will be a couple of my patients demonstrating the functional exam. So this patient has an antalgic gait. She's offloading the right limb. She's holding that side. Now when they transition from sitting to standing, you watch uh, as they reach out. They generally try to assist as they're either going down or coming up. It's quite evident that it's very painful. There's another example. He's assisting with one arm as he's sitting down. They'll frequently reach back to try and initiate the stand-up process. Another thing that you'll frequently see is they'll put their hand on their knee and push up. Stepping up is generally quite painful on the affected side. I have them step up with their good leg first so you can see what normal motion would be. There he has pain on his left side. You'll see that he has a shortened stance phase as he walks. The foot is externally rotated, he's slightly forward bent. Very commonly is reaching back to help both assist with sitting as well as standing up. When I'm talking to my patients, I have to describe the difference between a diagnostic and a therapeutic injection. With a diagnostic injection, I make them realize that they may get immediate pain relief, but that it may only last for a couple of hours and that they may return back to their pain. With a therapeutic injection, I let them know that they're going to have an anesthetic and a steroid injection, which will allow them to have immediate pain relief again, but then within one or two days, the steroid will start to work and that they may see some benefit from that that may persist for days to months to years. In a successful arthrogram, you'll see the dye flowing readily through the confines of the joint. If you're periarticular, you'll see contrasts staying close near the needle tip in somewhat of a smudged pattern. And the last pattern that you might see is a venous or vascular pattern, which would indicate that your needle is in bone. After I perform the injection, I mobilize the patient. This is important because it allows the anesthetic to distribute within the joint. Then I re-perform the functional testing and the provocative testing. When I'm performing the functional and provocative testing, I'm looking for 75% or greater reduction in their SI joint specific pain. A pain diary is commonly used to continue the evaluation of the patient's pain response. After the injection, the patient's gait is much improved, she's walking much easier, and her pain score is significantly reduced. Doing the sitting exam, she's able to sit much easier, she's in significantly less pain, she's able to quickly rise, she's not using her arm for assistance anymore. This patient demonstrates his ease in sitting no longer is using his hands to help assist him. He's able to move much quicker. His pain score was significantly reduced. He's not using his arms to assist off of the chair. Here he is stepping up. 
before he exhibited a lot of pain. You could see that in his face with grimacing. Afterwards, he was able to easily step up and down. This gentleman's gait markedly improved. His pain in his buttock region was now gone. This patient is quite stoic, just in his visual appearance, but did note a significant reduction in his pain. He's now sitting more evenly over his pelvis. He's able to transition to standing much easier. The patient is stepping up much easier now. He no longer exhibits a facial grimace. Documentation that I like to send to my referring physicians includes a complete history and physical exam. The history is important to note the positive subjective findings that the patient describes to you that are consistent with an SI joint disorder. The physical exam is important to list the provocative as well as the functional scores. This is done both before as well as after the injection. Complete documentation of the procedure is included. That includes the volume of injecting that you used, the anesthetic, whether it was used alone or whether it was used in conjunction with a steroid, as well as the morphology of the injection. You need to delineate that the dye was seen flowing within the joint confines and did not escape, or if there's a capsular tear that you know that it's ventral or dorsal and where it is at in relationship to the sacral anatomy. And last, fluoroscopic images should be included with your documentation to confirm to your referring source that your injection was intraarticular. Once the source of the patient's pain has been established to be the SI joint, then the non-surgical options are as follows. Oral medications, physical therapy, steroid injections, radiofrequency ablation. If the patient continues despite these therapies, then the patient may be considered for minimally invasive SI joint fusion.